Uh, we've got one of probably my favorite guests uh, back in. Um, absolutely uh, awesome mind. Uh, the uh, Lynn Alden, by the way, um, is the, that person. And I can tell you that when it came to, uh, as I mentioned prior to the event, when it came to bringing uh, his entire board on board in terms of his plans for the treasury, Michael Saylor took this lady's piece of research. I'm very happy to be on her uh, mailing list and I've also gone for the premium mailing list um, uh, just to get access to one of the most fastidious researchers, very earnest, very graceful, very humble, despite towering over all of us, uh, in terms of a deep, deep dives and detail on this incredible financial system uh, with us. I'm looking forward to bring her back uh, right into the room. And I'm going to go straight to audio and check if we have uh, Lynn. Lynn, how are you? Can you hear me okay? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, fabulous. Most certainly can. Um, do we have a camera uh, share as well, Lynn, that you can afford us? Uh, we should. I keep hitting uh, camera to go on, and it doesn't go on ah. within, the, within the software. Give it a second. M maybe hit it once. There's sometimes a bit of a delay, and we'll let it sit for a while. Let's uh, crack straight, uh, straight on anyway, and we'll give it a little bit of a moment to do. We're being slightly uh, frivolous uh, as well, and we're burying 2020, a super tough uh, <laughs> year for many. But also, there were a couple of things that were of great value, and I, we'll, we can talk a bit about the negatives. Beautiful. There you are. We see you. And the, is it Italy in the background? <laughs> It, uh, probably. <laughs> it looks like Tuscany. It looks absolutely lovely. Great to have you back. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on. Um, you're a real yep. favorite. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Absolutely. We're delighted. Um, by the way, a bit of frivolity as well first, being the Christmas spirit. Um, you've been uh, made the uh, leader of the uh, great uh, revolution. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see that. Uh, Trade, am I sharing screen? Sorry, we're doing something so complex here. It's, it's mind boggling. Let me try and make sure I've done it all right. Uh, here we go. We're running go to meeting within that. You are the Princess Leia of uh, the Rebel Alliance against uh, the dark forces of the economic realm that are looming, along with fellow friends uh, George Gammon, aka Luke Skywalker, and Brent Johnson joining us later. Uh, speaking to, uh, I think it's a bit rich to have me as Obi-Wan Kenobi. I wasn't sure if there was a dark Sith or something else a little bit more uh, intimidating. But anyway, um, super glad to have you back. Um, I suppose let's start. First of all, let me just uh, say something that I think everyone should do uh, before I hand over and bring you in. Guys, this is Lynn's uh, website. And can I just say, uh, you, you understand what people think of her research, given my opening gambit there. Go to lynnalden.com. You will go to the investing letter. Uh, I think her premium, correct me, Lynn, I, I don't think it was very much for premium for the value that you offer. Uh, give us the details if you can. Uh, so the premium research is $199 per year. Yeah, so I keep it at a pretty low price point. Yeah, I, I know I paid something with a one. I just wasn't exactly sure. It's absolutely uh, worth it. You get access to the thoughts of someone who is truly, truly on her game. Uh, you've been you've become a bit of a rising star, uh, Lynn. You've got immense fans in our YouTube following. Uh, people are really excited to uh, have you back on. I would say uh, while it was a tricky year for 2020, um, uh, your stars in great emergence. Congratulations for all that you've achieved and uh, the fame. Yeah, thank you. I mean, this is this has just been a challenging year for a lot of people. Uh, but you know, it's one of those things where it opens up opportunities as well. And so we all we all make the best of it. Uh, and you know, uh, so you know, I'm glad to uh, be putting this year to rest, though. You know, it's, it's, it's been a really interesting year. It's been a really busy year. Uh, but I think, you know, I'm hoping that for a lot of people 2021 is better. Thank you. Yeah, I think it has been uh, hard. Um, for I suppose for your opening gambit, one of the, I suppose, the first questions that we're asking all the guests that are coming on, what really came out for you in 2020 that was um, the uh, biggest, I suppose, new learning or maybe an enforcement of something that you already understood, but it suddenly became more apparently clear that you're going to then um, maybe treat 
consolidate into your already immense research and say, okay, going into 2021, that's what I learned and this is how we're adjusting for uh, the year ahead. I think the biggest enforcement is, uh, you know, always recognizing that things can go a lot farther than you think. Uh, and so when you think when you think something is overextended, there's a good chance it can it can you know double from there. And, and you know some examples of that, and that that can go both sides, that can go up or down. So for example, like if you thought oil was cheap, you know, let alone seeing a negative oil print, you know, wow, you know, and yeah. so, or or for example, if you thought, uh, you know, Tesla was expensive, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, in the middle of the year, see what it did later in the year. Uh, and so uh, I think that's that's the biggest takeaway is that. You know, whenever there's a trend, you have to be very careful not to be on the wrong side of it, uh, just because it it can roll over you if you if you think okay it has to stop here. The the reasonable thing is to stop here, uh, but then you know things always you know often go a lot further than they would based purely on reason. I love that. Uh, it's almost like the Jimi Hendrix realization, max distortion. Um, it can go even further on the upside and on the downside. Uh, and in a sense, it is, it is a market of great distortions, wouldn't you uh, say, Linz, in, in terms of almost perverse? Absolutely. I mean, this is, you know, it's the biggest economic shock in modern history combined with the, the biggest fiscal and monetary response in modern history. Uh, so, you're, you know, you're basically getting a lot of noise in the system. And one of the stocks that I, I pointed out a couple of days ago was kind of uh, representing a lot of this is Disney stock, right? Because Disney, if you look at their earnings, you know, they're vertically down. If you look at their stock price, it's vertically up. If you look at their physical properties, they're, they're crushed. If you look at their virtual pro properties, they're taking off. They're laying off uh, tons of employees, like, like 30,000 employees. Uh, and so that, that, that stock kind of encapsulates 2020. Uh, you know, more than most other stocks can. It kind of puts all up in, in one, you know, big example. You mentioned something positive on the virtual side for them. Is it enough to countervail the fact that their um, fun fairs and uh, entertainment places are going down or is it just hyper overvaluation? Well, so in terms of earnings, it does not cover it because Disney Plus, despite uh, being wildly successful, you know, in terms of uh, gathering users far faster than they originally thought, uh, it's not yet profitable. Uh, similar to Netflix, really. Uh, and so uh, at the same so if you look at earnings, uh, you know, for this year and, and likely, you know, what analysts are looking at for next year, earnings are way down yeah. uh, now. But because the, the stock market assigns a higher valuation to recurring, you know, software streaming, you know, service type businesses, uh, they're valuing that that, you know, that that virtual side of Disney and much higher uh, than they, you know, are basically discounting some of their physical stuff. And so I don't think it's uh, particularly attractive at this time. Uh, you know, I was, I was more bullish on Disney back in uh, 2018, 2019. I wrote about it a couple of times. Uh, but, you know, with this year, uh, I, I no longer view it as attractive. Now, that's with the caveat that, you know, going back to our previous point, that doesn't mean it can't go up, you know, another 50 percent from here for all we know. Uh, so you need some sort of reversal for, you know, any sort of uh, action to take place on the downside. Uh, but, you know, fundamentally, it is hard to say, you know, buy it here. And I think, you know, fundamentally, it's, it's strong. I think it's one of those things where instead, you know, we have to see how the dust settles. Maybe the stock price will come down. Maybe the earnings in the years ahead will come back up. And maybe at that point, Disney will be a better buying opportunity. But here it doesn't look it doesn't look very good. Aren't we at risk almost? It's become, you know, the one world trade. We, you know, people talk about, uh, you know, there was the emergence of SAB with Anheuser Busch, and it was almost like one world beer order. The SAB used to have all the emerging beers, and all the big brands were in the American company. In a sense, we've almost coming down to it's the proliferation and devaluation of currency trade that it's almost not a shorting market outside of debt, uh, possibly, which I have very, very concerns, grave concerns. But in the scope of equity, gold, silver, Bitcoin, uh, I pitched this. Is it is it the, the net long? Um, it's the, the buyer's trade um, with certain caveats regarding volatility, obviously moderate leverage, if any at all. But are we at that stage that uh, so many of the markets can overshoot. And most of the trends that are in the distortion that you've been describing, in other words, the hyper valuation within Disney, which is their virtual game, those are the things that are most likely of, of following the Tesla model to hyper extend as well. Yeah, so I think, you know, we are, we have been this year, of course, in a buyer's game. Uh, and 
I think there's a couple things to watch. So a lot of that has been correlated inversely with the dollar. And so as the dollar's weakened, as we've had a ton of liquidity, uh, we've seen a, a surge in risk assets, in reflation assets. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, that because we've come pretty far pretty fast, uh, you know, I think, I think, you know, there's a, a decent chance for corrections and more volatility uh, in the months ahead. Uh, but, you know, I think as we look out a couple of years, I think that's where, you know, the market starts to kind of sift through some of these things. And I think there's still a good amount of bullishness left for uh, especially some of the cyclical things, you know, things that, you know, if you look back to the past five years, they didn't do very well, even if they might have done well in the past several months. Uh, whereas I think some of the things that really took off for the past five years uh, and that, you know, by most metrics are very, very expensive. I think some of those are, are, are you know, vulnerable to a, a downtrend. And we've already seen kind of early signs of growth to value rotation. Now, there has been a bunch of those kind of fake outs in the past. Uh, and so we have to keep monitoring this one to see if it's real this time or if it's another fake out. Uh, but one thing that kind of adds this one uh, some degree of uh, credibility is that uh, it's occurring with a very big shift in monetary and fiscal policy, which yeah. which tends to be where those those growth to value rotations uh, occur. So uh, the probability for this one being a more sustained reversal is higher. But again, you have to keep confirming it just because there's always a possibility it just, it just rolls back over again uh, and, and keeps you know resulting in growth va overvaluation. There's been a small element recently, and that's quite near term, of the Russell and maybe the medium caps doing a little bit better as well than even the FANG megatechs recently, uh, although they've, they've hyper-performed over the longer term. Is that also possibly a little bit of a sign of a bit of rotational adjustment? The relative valuations got a bit too stretched apart? Um, yeah, that's mostly what I'm referring to. I mean, if you look back, if you look at the NASDAQ, for example, it had a it had a blow off top uh, in late August uh, and then it, it corrected, consolidated. And then we've, we've seen differences in the name. So, right, you know, for example, Tesla took off some of the others lagged. Uh, but, you know, basically ever since that that pivot point, uh, the tech stocks have on average been a little bit weaker. Uh, meanwhile, you know, with, with some of the vaccine announcements and, you know, with, with some of these other news uh, during that autumn period, We've seen a resurgence in some, in some value stocks, in small stocks, in mid-cap stocks, in foreign stocks. Uh, and so that, that's basically the growth to value rotation I'm referring to. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see, a, you know, somewhat of a tick back in that because some of these, you know, banks or energy names have come pretty far pretty fast. Uh, but I think, you know, looking out over the next three to five years, uh, there is some pretty good opportunity in some of those more cyclical uh, entities compared to, you know, all the capital that piled into Apple and Tesla and other stocks this year, uh, you know, if if we start to get say slightly rising inflation expectations or slightly high higher bond yields, uh, you know, some of the justifications that people use when they poured into those stocks at any price, right? Which is basically that you know, in a world without growth, they wanted to pour into companies that were growing, you know, regardless of their valuation. Yeah. Uh, but if that reverses it off, that sentiment shifts, uh, and and you know, uh, basically that that o those oceans of capital start looking in other directions. That are relative pawns in comparison. So the commodities market, uh, even even Bitcoin, as as well as it did this year, is still a pawn compared to some of the you know Absolutely. the global bond and and stock markets. Uh, and so uh, I still think that you know, if that rotation does continue after you know perhaps a pause, uh, you know that's one of those things. Just like how tech stocks went a lot further over the past five years than many people thought, including myself, if I would have you know given a guess two to three years ago, you know where some of these stocks would be. I think you know one if that rotation gets underway, some of those commodities, some of those other sorts of trades can then move a lot further than some people think. So a lot of people kind of look and say, you know, just because it's near term overbought, maybe it's over. Maybe maybe the rotation's finished. And sure, it could take a pause. But if that if that rotation is more structural, that's one of those things that could persist for years. I would just comment technically, it does look like it still could go a little further though the NASDAQ. I wouldn't be trying to uh, call uh, t uh, tops on it. Um, which is your favorite? Is Tesla your favorite most overvalued, if we can uh, call a fluffiness uh, a stock? Yeah, I think, I think Tesla is uh, fundamentally uh, the most uh, vulnerable. Um, uh, but yes, I agree. You, it, you, know, you don't want to stand in front of a freight train, right? No. So anyone trying to uh, short it or anything like that need, needs a very clear cover point, needs a very clear kind of technical signal. Uh, so yeah. it's not just something you say, it's fundamentally overvalued, therefore I want to short it. Yeah. Uh, so no, it's more like fundamentally overvalued, and then you sit there and wait and wait and wait until you see some sort of reversal. 
Yeah. And so we got a we got a partial reversal, like I said, back in August. Uh, but they have managed to recover, and then we've seen we've seen a you know a performance gap between say Tesla doing pretty well and Amazon doing weaker. Uh, and of course, Tesla's big catalyst at that point was inclusion into the S and P five hundred, uh, which is now largely finished. Yes. Uh, and so it'd be it'd be interesting to see now that all that required buying is done, what's going to happen next week. Yes, you would almost think it's almost vulnerable um, now, particularly more than ever. And in some sense, I'll just take some of those drawings off because it, it broke out of what we call the continuation. We, we trade technically and we, we know it's fundamentally not well managed, but because we shoot and scoot hit and run uh, traders with clear stop losses, we did, we did actually uh, commit the cardinal sin of holding our nose and buying, Lynn, um, and it paid. Uh, but we are also very fundamentally aware that it is a parallel universe in some senses. Um, and that's why we shoot and scoot and we take, we take our good gains uh, and we run. But it's just, it's just such a, uh, it's almost an incredible story that uh, I'm finding a little bit difficult to believe. But I think sometimes you just, you just got to follow the money. Um, that, that, that was the continuation we were in on. Let me just bring that size down a little bit. Sorry. Um, I think you know it. Uh, and that was probably roundabout. It was very fortuitous because the announcement of the inclusion in the index came when we were just about uh, inching up there. And that's run at virtually the 700. And I would imagine it probably just run that technical level as well. Um, we, if, if, we, if we say these tech stocks are the great underblown, what do you like right now in an equity uh, level? Where are you, is, is there any value anywhere? And if there is, is it only relatively valuable compared to how ridiculous everything else is? Or is there some real by even, ben, you know, Graham standards value out there? What do you like? Uh, so if you ask me that this summer, I would say that there's, you know, there's pretty good deep value out there. And ex uh, an example would have been some of the energy names. Uh, yeah. But, you know, since we've had, a, uh, you know, somewhat of a bounce in some of these commodity names, some of these value cyclical stocks, uh, you know, we've kind of come off of those uh, deeper oversold levels. Uh, but I still think, you know, if, if you look around the world and at certain sectors, uh, there are stocks that are trading for absolutely normal valuations, right? So there are some, for example, healthcare stocks that are trading at the same valuations they've traded at for, for many years. And that by right. most standards, you know, are, are totally normal. Uh, same thing if you look at, for example, I looked at some, uh, you know, Japanese trading companies or Japanese industrials. Uh, a lot of those are trading at, you know, uh, pretty low valuations. Uh, despite the fact that their fundamentals are doing pretty well, and J the Japanese market's actually been doing quite well since 2012. Uh, and so, uh, if you look at uh, certain global banks, for example, not many, not many investors want to touch banks, uh, but you know they're historically trading pretty well. A lot of them are able to get fee income uh, to offset the fact that their net interest margins are tighter. Uh, and so, uh, and I still think that you know even in the energy sector, we have had this you know this rally. Uh, but I, I still think, you know, at looking at several years, some of these energy transporters, some of these, uh, you know, uh, low cost, strong balance sheet uh, energy producers uh, are, are reasonably well positioned. Yeah, great. I like that uh, response. That's the Japanese Nikkei, which seems to have had a great rebound from the March lows from about 16,000 to 26,000. So that's pretty decent. Um, one thing I noticed in terms of how you're talking is that you, you're definitely, you know, you're not American centric at all. Uh, and you're talking a lot about the foreign markets, because my finding is the overall, the US in the markets as a whole, are extremely fully uh, valued. I'm just wondering, uh, what's your favorite geographies, and maybe even a comment for our UK friends, we, we were live streaming this at the same time. So uh, on the YouTube channel, so it's great. I'm what, keeping half an eye for some questions, and I might pipe some of them in. But uh, if I take the FTSE 100, uh, I, I, I'm sure you're probably familiar, but the UK stock market has been pretty abysmal. Um, it's probably dominated uh, by financials, we might be able to say. Um, but we're at about 6533. Let me pull that through a little bit. Um, it's slightly disappointing amount of history that I've got there. I'll look for a better one. Um, but actually, I moved to the UK uh, when Tony Blair was in charge in 1999. And uh, he was bragging about the stock markets and it was just shy of the uh, 7,000 level. And he said he was bragging about, you know, we had all time highs, you know, politicians claiming credit for stock market movements as they are one to do. Uh, and to this day, um, whoops, that's the FTSE short. Sorry, I'm messing around a bit here. Uh, to, the, to this day, it still hasn't recouped the seven, the six, eight, six, nine thousand that it was on. 
Um, I've got a bit of a short history chart here um, while I'm scrambling to find a good one, but we're at 6533. So that's the better parts of 21 years uh, and essentially flat, uh, even slightly down. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at, you know, Europe as a whole has been in like a two decade bear market. Uh, Japan has been in a, a three decade bear market. Uh, and of course, with Japan, they bottomed in 2012. So they've been in a, a more of a, a decent bull trend for the UK in particular. I, I do think that, you know, the market is reasonably attractive at this point. So, you know, their their index is kind of uh, dominated by some of these more value plays. Right. So you have you have, uh, you know, uh, Unilever, you have the healthcare companies, uh, you know, the banks, uh, for, for UK banks, I'm kind of, you know, torn on, uh, you know, they have uh, alcohol companies, they have tobacco companies, they have commodity companies, energy. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of that's not the stuff that did very well this year. No. Uh, but if you, yeah, if you do get that more kind of a cyclical rotation, uh, and you have kind of a several years of value outperformance. Uh, I do think that the UK market is one to look at, especially as it gets past this year and some of the political headlines. Uh, and so, you know, looking out around the world, I mean, I think, uh, you know, earlier this year, I was pretty bullish on Chinese tech stocks. Uh, they did pretty well. Now I'm more interested in some of these other emerging markets. I think Latin America has has some value. I like Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, India's, uh, some of my Indian stocks, um, you know, I, I focus on one of the Indian banks in particular. That one got a little bit stretched, uh, but I still think it looks good for with a several year view. Uh, I think Russia's pretty attractive. Uh, that's one of the cheapest markets. Uh, of course, they're, you know, they're, they're mainly commodities and and some banks and things like that. So they're, they're of course, very value tilted, uh, very unloved market. And so I, I, I'm overall looking for kind of a, a, a period where international stocks outperform U.S. stocks. Uh, and of course, we have to keep confirming that, you know, it's, it's never just kind of set on a, on, a, on a strategy and just kind of, you know, sticking to it at all costs. But, yeah. you know, as long as certain things maintain in place, as, certain, as long as certain monetary policies, certain fiscal policies, uh, certain things with the dollar, certain things with, you know, the, the virus, whatever the case may be, as long as certain things start to play out, I, I do think there's a pretty good chance of continued uh, international outperformance. And when you when you're talking about the international outperformance, are you taking into account the dollar devaluation that we've had? In other words, in a real term, in some form of a Woku uh, currency, or are you talking in nominal terms? Uh, so I think if we just t t take them all in dollar terms, right? Uh, that I that I think that they are <coughs> you know can outperform U.S. equities. Yeah. Uh, and you know it's it's one thing about the dollar again is it's one of those things where uh, you know one of the concerns right now is that it you know it, it's somewhat of a crowded trade to be short the dollar. Uh, dollar bearish, you know, was unpopular earlier this year, and now it's pretty popular. Uh, and uh, but uh, you know, again, if you look at say uh, the weekly chart, it's not even oversold the dollar index. And so uh, you know, if we look back over the past 50 years, there have been three really big dollar cycles, right? So we had the the big dollar spike in the mid 80s, then we had the second dollar spike in the in the late 90s, early 2000s, and yeah. ever since you know uh, uh, late 2014, we've been in the third uh, you know strong dollar environment. Uh, and that particular strong dollar environment was triggered by the end of quantitative easing. So as soon as the Fed uh, stopped uh, quantitative easing in mid-2014, the dollar just shot up compared to other currencies because on a relative basis, the U.S. had tight monetary policy, which yeah. is, of course, a joke because, you know, we had <laughs> zero rates and we just, you know, basically because we were not actively debasing currency, we were now one of the tight ones. And so we entered a strong dollar environment. Then in 2017, we had kind of a fake out, right? Because the dollar weakened, we had a global boom in, in uh, you know, international equities. Uh, but then the Fed uh, at the beginning of 2018 began quantitative tightening. And they're also, of course, raising interest rates. And so we, we again had, uh, you know, a relatively tight U.S. monetary policy. And so, you know, that, that stopped the dollar decline, put it back on a bullish trend uh, that lasted into, you know, mid-2019. Uh, but then the you know, due to the repo spike in late 2019, the Fed was forced to uh, end quantitative tightening, go back to basically quantitative easing. Uh, then, of course, we had the pandemic. We had a brief dollar spike. The Fed, uh, you know, accelerated quantitative easing. Uh, and ever since then, we've been on a pretty bearish trend for the dollar. And so my base case is that we're probably ending this, this overall uh, third dollar spike, uh, which could bring us to pretty low levels on the dollar. Uh, and so that can, you know, it's, it's, it can be oversold in the near term, right? So I, I do think that bounces are warranted whenever you get oversold, whenever you get too many too many people on one side of a trade. Uh, but I do think this is one of those things where, kind of like how tech stocks kept, you know, over 
they kept outperforming over the past five years, despite the fact that there were always concerns that it's too crowded, that too many people are, are bullish on them, that the valuations are too high. I do think that over the next, you know, call it three years or more, you could have a similar situation with the dollar where people keep saying it's oversold, it's got a, it's got a, you know, it's got a bounce, it's got to do this, and there will be bounces. Uh, but I, I do think that that thing can potentially power pretty low over a three to five year period, uh, as long as it, as long as it keeps, you know, breaking certain support levels and and the technicals keep, you know, kind of being in its favor. And uh, in fairness to to you, um, you were you had reverted quite bearish um, on the dollar around about this period as well. So you've been very accurate on that. Uh, a good call and well played. Um, there's a technical low in and around the 88 that I guess that yep. you're expecting to see uh, fall with uh, further dollar devaluation. And if I just bring a little bit more of the chart on, I'm hoping you can see okay. Um, you, we had the huge spurt up that you referred to with the relative uh, tightening or less debasement um, situation on the August uh, July, August 14-ish. So how far do we go? Do we return to the 80? Is it around tripper from the breakout? Because this was uh, for us a bit of a technical breakout when uh, that occurred and that that was pretty single-minded. And actually it does illustrate your point as well. People would have called tops on dollar strength all the way through this period. Uh, and you actually would have traded right up at one point at nearly 104, um, which could indeed mean um, there's still plenty more to come. Where do you, where do you see? I mean, it's, it's a looking glass question, I suppose, but uh, how far do you think it could go? Uh, so I am, I am watching that 88 level pretty closely. Uh, and it's also, I mean, that we, we also could just isolate the euro to uh, dollar chart because that's the biggest component of the dollar index. And that has, you know, that has a similar support level around that same uh, point, uh, something like, you know, $125 to the euro. Uh, and so uh, I think that's a, that's a key, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see kind of a, you know, resistance or support there, depending on, on which, you know, axis you're looking at, uh, you know, dollar euro or uh, dollar index 88. Uh, and so that'd be kind of a prime area to have some sort of bounce or some sort of, you know, uh, kind of bouncing off that support level. Uh, but if we do break that, uh, yeah, I think, I think, you know, in the years ahead, we can see, you know, dollar index at 80 or below uh, to kind of, you know, close out this uh, dollar uh, bull period. Now, of course, there are certain things that the Fed comes out, you know, the next meeting six weeks from now and says, hey, we're going to start tapering bond purchases and we're going to, you know, then, then you reevaluate that. So that's, yeah. That's, just, you know, as long as the, the Fed maintains that rather aggressive uh, quantitative easing uh, and very large deficits. And, and of course, uh, you know, compared to Europe and Japan and some of these other markets, uh, you know, currencies that make up that dollar index, most of those have current account surpluses. Yeah. Uh, and that tends to be supportive for a currency. And so, you know, when all when all central banks around the world are actively, you know, supplying liquidity and debasing their currency, the United States currency has a tendency to fall harder because, you know, we have this structural current account deficit. Yeah. Uh, and so that's that's generally why we see the dollar have these big shifts. Uh, but that's always dependent on the fact that the Fed is easing. So, you know, if we see signs that they that they stop or slow down, we have to reevaluate that that dollar bear thesis. Yeah, that's great. I mean, technically, uh, this was an interesting base during the euro crisis. This was Draghi's do whatever it take uh, at 140. And for the technicians, it's kind of a little bit of a W bottom that if we retrace up to the 125, you, you, you might then actually have a similar target uh, arguable that could even take out the pre draggy um, I think it was called the bazooka uh, statement where he said he'd do all it takes. So that could be a really powerful move. How do we, how do we play that? I, it, on his comments, just before you answer that, sorry, I, I also felt, I got the impression that there, were, there was a very precarious situation for the emerging FX currencies taking place. So particularly on the lira, uh, it was getting most disorderly in its down. It's a big country, it's a big population. And no matter what anybody says, it's the gateway to uh, Asia and Europe. Um, and this recent devaluation has taken some of the heat out of the highly indebted in dollar terms uh, emerging market nations. So is it not almost, if, forgive me for thinking at a macro level, but it was almost like a globally synchronized necessity. Otherwise, we would have had uh, the bricks uh, falling out of bed. Because at that peak of just prior at the top of the COVID when we had the dollar spike, 
had that continued, it would have it would have escalated. It was also the repo and a lot of things going on there. That would have that would have seen a lot of the uh, emerging nations falling out of out of bed. And the currencies market, uh, and for those listening, I mean, we're talking around a lot of things, but understanding the direction of the dollar and uh, its relationship, I think if you can get that one close to being right and a bias, you have a massive advantage. Um, was it also to save the emergings from falling over in terms of their debt? Uh, and does that now make the emergings almost an interesting area? Because you've seen the RAND come back to even sub-16, 15 levels. Uh, after threatening really high levels, it's some of the pressure on the lira has gone out, and the same goes for many other nations whose currencies have been really falling out of bed. The Indian rupee, the Brazilian real, these are big populations and big um, nations of people. I'm just interested in your emerging market comment with the FX uh, angle first before we drill down into maybe anything else like equities. Yeah, so one thing I do is I look at uh, the emerging markets. Uh, what are their dollar denominated debts as a percentage of GDP and what are their FX reserves as a percentage of GDP? And the reason both are important is because some of them have substantial dollar debts, but then they also have substantial uh, you know, dollar assets to defend their currency when needed. Whereas there are other ones like Turkey and Argentina, they were quite vulnerable because they had the dollar debts, but they didn't really have a ton of FX yeah. reserves. And so those are the ones where we saw currency crises. Whereas if you look at a country like China, uh, you know, they have a lot of a uh, absolute dollar debt, right? So the total amount of dollar debt is pretty high, but as a percentage of GDP it, is pretty manageable. And then also their, their large FX reserves as a percentage of GDP also support that. And so that's yeah. why we haven't really seen a currency crisis in a place like uh, China or in, in much of, uh, you know, Asia in general, because a lot of them have high FX reserves. Uh, but we have seen weakness in, in, in Latin America more. We've seen weakness in Turkey. Uh, and so... The U.S.'s actions were, uh, you know, not altruistically to bail out emerging markets. It was mainly to bail out bail out the U.S. Treasury market. And yeah. because when when that dollar spiked, it breaks a lot of things. It broke it broke emerging markets. Uh, it broke, you know, the whole euro dollar system. Uh, but then, as a consequence, it broke the U.S. Treasury market. Uh, and so, and the reason for that is because foreigners, if they, you know, they have all this dollar denominated debt coming through. And, uh, you know, uh, that was at the time when oil was like, you know, falling out of bed. And so the, the circulation of dollar trade around the world was was was, uh, you know, weakening. And we have all of this dollar denominated debt out in the world. Uh, and that still has to be serviced. So that represents demand for dollars. And I know you're going to have Brent. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if you already had him or you're going to have no, him. That's, still that's to follow, yeah. He, he, yeah. So there's a lot. Of, and that's a point he's totally right on that. There's a lot of dollar based debt in the world. And all of that represents demand for the dollars. And yeah. so we saw in March this scramble for dollars. Everybody had to have dollars. And so what some of those countries did is they, you know, they have something like 13 trillion in, in dollar dominated debts out in the world, you know, offshore of the United States. But, you know, they also have something like 42 trillion in U.S. assets. That includes treasuries, that includes corporate bonds, that includes U.S. real estate, uh, that includes U.S. stocks. And there's not always a, a high uh, match. So, for example, you know, a place like Turkey does not have a lot of dollar assets, but a place like Saudi Arabia does. And so what we saw is some of those uh, you know, the nations that did have treasury reserves, uh, they started selling treasuries to get dollars. And so when you had the foreign sector being net sellers of treasuries, uh, then, of course, you had risk parity funds uh, that are highly levered. They had to start selling treasuries. And so we had, you know, the treasury market became illiquid in March. Yeah. And the Federal Reserve freaked, freaked out. If you look through their meeting minutes, they said the treasury market ceased to function. Uh, and they, they said they turned to extraordinarily rapid uh, purchases of treasuries to, to fix that. And so they bought three, they bought $1 trillion worth of treasuries in three weeks. Uh, and to basically, you know, create dollars, smooth out the treasury market. And then they, you know, even though they tapered that, you know, extraordinarily, uh, you know, rapid purchase, they're still buying at $120 billion of QE per month and something like 80 or 90 billion of that is treasuries. Uh, and so we are seeing basically this, this you know, uh, less tightening. And so uh, the, you know, the main concern is to basically defend the treasure market because you know, they can let certain things fail, but they'll never let the treasure market fail. And so whenever that kind of has too many sellers, not enough buyers, you'll see the Federal Reserve come in and create new bank reserves and buy treasuries as needed. Right. So in, in that essence, in your opinion, that was the pressure valve that saw um, them provide their extra dollar liquidity. Yeah, it's all fun and games till the treasury market breaks, right? Yeah. Because it's like it's also if you look back at um, uh, it's a little different, but it's similar. If you look back at the at the 2018 Powell pivot, so he was he was saying you know quantitative tightenings on autopilot, 
and uh, you know he was saying that we're going to keep hiking, hike, hiking rates. And then uh, in uh, the fourth quarter of 2018, we had a pretty sharp sell-off in, in U.S. assets, right? So the S&P 500 had a 20% decline. Uh, we saw a disproportionate sell-off in, in uh, U.S. tech equity. So if you look at Apple, it had something like a 30 or 40% decline that quarter. It was, it was kind of crazy. Uh, and, uh, it, and so, and that's, that's unthinkable today, but that was, you know, that was two years ago. And, uh, you know, and that, that basically forced Powell to then say, okay, we're actually, you know, we're going to always evaluate uh, financial conditions. Nothing's on autopilot, you know, forgive us. Uh, and uh, so a lot of people looked at the stock market and thought that, you know, Powell must be trying to defend the stock market, which is, you know, in part true. Uh, but was a more concerning thing is that underneath the surface, uh, there was, there were no uh, high yield bonds issued for like six weeks during that period. It, the whole credit market just froze. Wow. And so that's actually the more fundamental thing that, and, and Powell has a background in that. He was aware of that. And so uh, that's the more underlying problematic thing whenever he's, whenever basically the dollar situation gets too tight. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that it's, it's those things under the surface, like, you know, the credit market or even more acutely, the treasury market, when those things break, that's when the Fed just, you know, they, they break the glass and they come in with whatever tool they need. Uh, whereas the stock market, uh, you know, they, they can let that squirm a little bit because that's a little bit less critical. Yes. Uh, so many people forget because we are a culture of equity that, in fact, it's it's the debt markets are far larger and, and the currency yeah. markets on top of that even larger still. Um, and that's the real plumbing of the economic system, not yeah. uh, your favorite stock at all. Uh, and that was a great reminder there. Thank you for that. Uh, so, OK, so we've had a good look at currencies. And uh, at the moment, it seems we're probably going to buy us to a little bit of continuation. You're not concerned a little bit. Uh, I suppose we've spoken about it's a crowded trade. You mentioned you'd already touched on that. It's record shorts, I have heard on uh the dollars but the points we kind of taking as a result of that is it can become more record uh before it uh potentially eventually turns and there's quite a bit of potential downside and if we were to have any further problems in the u.s debt markets we could even see an acceleration potentially um has that scenario been considered by you uh, yeah, and and you know to, to get onto your point about whether I'm concerned, it's mostly for me about uh, defining time time frames. And so uh, you know I've been asked in a couple of things what I think about the dollar, and my my answer has been you know I have no clue over the next three to six months what's going to happen with the dollar. Like uh, so I'll leave that to to people that are following the technicals, uh, people that are you know things like that. Think you know whether or not we get stimulus. There's all these there's these kind of like a couple variables that will yeah. influence. Uh, what happens over the next three to six months? Also, the virus, if we get, you know, more and more shutdowns in Europe, Europe, the United States or things like that. Uh, and that can prevent, you know, dollars from circulating around the, the world. And so you can get a pretty quick backup in the dollar and relieve some of that, you know, crowded trade situation uh, pretty readily. Uh, but then I'd be, you know, I'd be on the other, you know, if that were to happen, I would be then uh, you know, expecting another round of dollar weakness from there. And so it's not that I think that, you know, it's crowded and has to keep getting more crowded or more extending. It's more just like, you know, over the next three to five years, I think that this will extend pretty hard, uh, but then it will have counter rallies uh, within that context. And I wouldn't be surprised because we are so crowded at this point to see one of those counter rallies happen in the next three months or so. I wouldn't be, if in fact, I would consider that, you know, a higher than 50% chance uh, just because, you know, when something does get stretched, uh, it has a tendency to, you know, the probability that it's going to push back, uh, you know, heightens. Absolutely. You're talking technically. I think uh, you're, you're probably on the trend remaining the same, but there are a bit more volatility and pushback maybe coming along the way uh, on the way down. So it, because it was pretty much a very almost straight line. If you look at the weekly chart, if you're not overly um, on the minutia time frames. Yeah. Um, which brings in gold. I've got, I'm checking the comments as well, Lynn. So if you see me peeping out of my right eye, you have my full attention, but just we're live streaming. And one of the folks, great closet says, uh, precious metals, uh, and your take on that. Well, there's, there's precious metals. I'm, uh, I also want to pay you credit for a uranium call, uh, that you made not so long ago on your newsletter as well. That's had us looking at the energy markets, but let's stay with a question from the, the questioner. Uh, gold and silver. I think it ties in a little bit now with the dollar because you can't really discuss them independently of each other. Um, but even if we considered, say, the gold against the pound or the euro as, for a, as a separate chart, which I can also bring out, um, how you stand 
on the precious metals? Uh, so their strongest correlation, especially for gold, the strongest correlation is with real rates. Uh, and so if you look at uh, you know real rates defined as, in this case, the 10-year Treasury minus the 10-year the break, uh, inflation break even, uh, so that you know that bottomed in late August, uh, you know right around that that same time that the Nasdaq had a big blow off top and gold had a big blow off top, and so neg uh, real rates got down to negative 1.08 uh, percent, and so, and that was you know that's a that's a pretty big low, uh, yeah. and then uh, we started to get 10-year yields rising, uh, so inflation expectations stayed relatively flat uh, while nominal yields began rising, and so uh, that that negative yield. Uh, Push back up from being at negative 1.08 uh, percent to, uh, if I recall, 0.77 percent negative. Uh, and so it's still negative; it's just less negative than it was. But then, you know, in November that started, uh, you know, rolling over again. And so now we're back down to negative one percent. And so, uh, and, and we've seen some life out of gold, uh, you know, in the past couple of weeks. Uh, you know, after it came off of a bottom. Uh, and so my my general you know, expectation is that in the year ahead, I think gold is likely to do well. Uh, there are a couple, uh, you know, catalysts that could prevent that. You know, one is that, you know, that revival of gold would be based on the premise that that real rates are going to go negative again. They're going to go, uh, you know, deeper than negative 1.08%. Uh, now, if we were to get, for example, uh, you know, the 10-year keeps going up, uh, or, you know, or if we get, uh, you know, just kind of a, a sharp decline in inflation expectations, uh, then we could see more weakness out of gold. The other thing is that you know there there's some concern this year that that Bitcoin's taking some of some of gold's thunder. Uh, and I you know so far I think that that concern's been overblown because you know a lot of people are looking at the weakness in gold and assuming it has to be because of Bitcoin, whereas gold has mainly just been doing what it always does, which is you know follow real interest rates. Uh, and so uh, it's been rather tightly correlated to real interest rates, and therefore it's not really doing anything unusual. Uh, but yeah, you know, we do have a couple kind of select instances of hedge funds saying they sold their gold to buy Bitcoin or things like that. I don't expect that to really spread too much, but if it were to, uh, that could present some weakness in gold. Uh, but overall, I, I like a pretty broad mix here. So I like I like gold, I like silver, I like uranium, I like platinum, uh, you know, copper. I've been at bullish on copper. That's got, that's again, it's a little bit stretched here. Uh, but you know, long term, I like copper, uh, and uh, then I also like Bitcoin, and so. Uh, rather than bet too heavily on any one of them, uh, I like all of them with a with a multi-year view. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you're talking about a stable of horses and not just overweighting on the fastest horse, which I think is very smart and pertinent. Um, a bit of old world money, a bit of new world money. Uh, that makes total, total sense uh, to me. Uh, so just going back to the metals, because this will affect silver, it'll affect platinum, which has lagged horribly because palladium has been eating its dinner on the catalytic converters front. Um, it seems that the negative, uh, the negative real rates, what if I just throw in the fact that I don't trust the inflation rates? I'm like a John Williams guy, shadow stats, and actually we're probably way more negative than is being um, admitted to. And even if they go positive, it's a fake positive. We should be probably at about 10%. In fact, we're having inflation. It's an asset price inflation. Um, there's a lot of retail skullduggery in terms of um, what they call, uh, I, I forget the phrase people use, but um, uh, size adjustments. They call it micro reducements in packaging sizes with minor price increases rather than a substantial price increase for a like-for-like -like product. Um, uh, toilet rolls not unwinding to the same length, various uh, um, basket of goods, uh, let's call it, they shape shift a tiny bit. Um, and you're of the view that they're, regardless of the statistics, we're deeper in the negative real interest rates because that's what's required with the amount of debt that we've created. Um, doesn't that keep, doesn't it, even in spite of possible variances and upticks in rates, still keep the heater and the bull bias on precious metals generally across the board? I think though, I think so. And that's why I keep holding. And so uh, based on where we are in terms of a long-term debt cycle, I do think that real interest rates uh, are likely to be negative uh, for quite a long time, uh, basically meaning that, 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 that bonds and cash will have to lose value uh, you know, in order to for debt markets not to explode, and so that's a similar situation that we saw in the 1940s, uh, and so I, you know, I'm expecting kind of a similar outcome here. Uh, and as it pertains to uh, you know the real inflation rate uh, rather than just the headline rate, 
there are a couple of things. One is that if you look at uh, gold itself, gold tends to follow the real the the reported rate uh, of uh, you know of uh, CPI, and so it's over the very long term gold keeps up with broad money supply. And so that actually is gro- that's the much higher rate, right? So money supply is growing at a much quicker w- rate than uh, official CPI. And so in that sense, gold benefits from asset price inflation that is higher than consumer price inflation. Uh, but then if you look at, say, a five-year chart of real interest rates and gold price, uh, gold is tightly correlated to those reported official uh, you know, real rates. And so that that's what dictates its movements in any kind of given you know, uh, multi-year period. And so my base case is that, you know, broad money supply is going to keep growing at, you know, 10% a year or more. Uh, and, uh, you know, according to my model, uh, gold is uh, pretty fairly valued against that. And so I would expect to see continued gold price appreciation. Uh, and if you then, if you do get deeper uh, negative rates, uh, as officially reported, uh, then gold could, you know, kind of spike. Uh, and there are a couple of catalysts for that. One is, you know, we'll see if the Fed tries to move to control the long end of the yield curve. So far, they've been, you know, they're taking a lot of excess supply off the market by buying a lot of those bonds, uh, but they're not formally blocking the, the the long end of the curve from rising. And so if you, you know, in, in the couple of years ahead, if you do get kind of a spike in inflation, uh, you know, even officially reported inflation, uh, then I do think you could get, you know, the Fed's probably not going to let bond yields get very high. Uh, and so you could see, uh, you know, a negative spike in real yields and you could see a positive spike in gold and other commodities. Uh, and, you know, as far as, uh, you know, official inflation, uh, like you pointed out, I like to separate there's I view it three types of inflation. Right. So this monetary inflation, which is just, you know, increases in the broad money supply, especially on a per capita basis. And then there's asset price inflation, which is when a lot of that money just flows into financial assets like, you know, stocks and gold yeah. and bonds and art and wine and Bitcoin. Uh, and then there's consumer price inflation, which is a much harder basket to measure because, you know, there's, you know, we have, for example, health care is going up very high. We have uh, child care is going up very high services. We have shrinkflation, like you talked about, like uh, that, you know, that sneaky form of inflation. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But then it, it's, it's been offset to some extent by, the, by a couple factors. One is, uh, you know, manufacturing inflation remains uh, uh, pretty low. So, you know, by, by uh, technology and offshoring. Uh, You know, electronics, for example, keep getting cheaper. Uh, Software keeps eating the world. Uh, And then also, you know, if you look at a lot of commodity prices outside of the precious metals, a lot of them are roughly where they were 15 years ago. And because we've had this period of of commodity oversupply, uh, and so, uh, you know, until basically oil is is tight and gas is tight, you know, as long as commodities remain pretty cheap, it's hard to get that really, really broad, uh, you know, uh, uh, consumer price inflation outside of the services sector. And so uh, if in the years ahead, due to all of this uh, CapEx cuts in the oil fields that we've had this year, and if you see, you know, you know, copper shortages, you see energy shortages, you see uranium shortages, whatever the case may be, you can get you can get that that can potentially trickle uh, into, uh, you know, a much higher kind of broad CPI basket. I think especially when combined with with very high, uh, you know, kind of a broad money supply increases. Yes, I was just wondering if that isn't exactly the the case that's possibly threatening on a number of fronts. Uh, I mean, u- uranium supply they 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 clear in an overhang. They're under supplying, but there's an overhang. Um, many people are always trying to quantify silver, and we're expecting the use to spike with solar and all these green uh, initiatives that seem very politically pertinent and you know very much this this color for our times. And uh, yeah, and it just the, the money proliferation the, uh, politically because economics is, is, is politics as well, power, money and social choices. Um, this pivot. Well, it seems the Democrats are getting in and this there's some final twists that some people might think are possible still. But it, to me, it seems very much like they're getting in. Um, there's there's an embracement. I mean, is modern monetary theory now accepted policy? Because that would add to the other very important variable that you mentioned that, you know, uh, liquidity, uh, the on ramp for UBI, because we are we're going into another crushing of the SME cycle with uh, the multiple lockdowns um, and all of that, uh, aren't, aren't we pretty strong in that case that we're going to be high liquidity, um, money for all, proliferation, um, which probably points again to further dollar weakness to highlight your, I think, probably quite accurate view that 
we've probably got lower to go before we bottom. Um, and as a result, this, this is going to be pretty supportive fundamental environment uh, for Bitcoin, gold, uh, silver across the board. I, I think so. I think when we look out over the next uh, several years, I do think we're going to continue to see very large deficits uh, that are being you know, largely monetized by central banks uh, in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Uh, and you know, to, to the extent that MMTs embrace, it really depends on what market you look at. And so in the United States, uh, it's a mixed bag. So a lot of politicians are moving in that direction. Other politicians are you know, still uh, you know, kind of resistant to that direction. Uh, in Europe, of course, because uh, you know, uh, all of those countries gave up their monetary sovereignty. And so they have to agree together uh, on certain fiscal packages. Uh, you know, that, that's a much slower moving process as well. And so you have a lot of those countries that are not on the MMT uh, you know, train. Uh, Japan is, you know, they're, because they're not very polarized, they're able to do pretty big things pretty fast. So they're, you know, they're, they're kind of like the U.S. where they're, you know, they're potentially on the, a little bit on the MMT side here. Uh, and so I, I think it really depends on, on what, what markets you look at. And I think over, over the, the overall picture here, you know, we are seeing a, a sharp increase in, in broad money supply. I do think that's going to continue. And then, yeah, the big question is what's going to happen with commodity scarcity. And, you know, a lot of people think of, of the United States as still being the center of, of commodities. But really, at this point, it's, 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 you know, Asia and China in particular. China is like the biggest consumer of copper. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're the biggest energy importer. And so, you know, a lot of eyes have to be on China to see what their policy is going to be uh, in terms of, you know, how it could affect uh, iron, could affect copper, could affect uh, oil. Uh, and so, but overall, I think globally, we're probably looking at a period of, you know, continued money supply increases and then potentially some degree of uh, commodity shortage as we look out into maybe late 2021, 2022, 2023. Now, in the near term, you know, with uh, rising virus, uh, you know, hospitalizations and, and economic shutdowns uh, and just, uh, you know, just this general period of uncertainty, you know, I don't really have a strong view over the next three to six months what's going to happen. I mean, this, this could be a, a pretty rough winter. We're still going through a solvency cycle, right? So earlier this year, you know, there was a lot of liquidity issues, uh, but we're still seeing solvency problems where a lot of companies have debts. A lot of them don't have cash flows yet. Uh, and so I, you know, I still think we have a lot more kind of uh, some deflationary shocks to go through over the next several months. And so I'm not really kind of pushing the, the, the inflation theme too hard in this kind of shorter period. Uh, but I do think the longer you look out, the more the odds favor uh, that more inflationary scenario. Uh, I was going to say in my next point, and I think you almost touched really, almost clarified on that. Surely most of the risks are to the downside in, in this, this tail end of economic cycle. Uh, if there's an asymmetry for bear or negative shocks, then optimistic ones uh, almost. And as a result, that must keep a sort of deflationary boogeyman ever present in the closet waiting to stumble out uh, to create another. Uh, well, we've had our pandemic event, um, but other repo type rates more directly financial rather than uh, second, second derivative financial. Um, so all, all, all most of the shocks, bearish ones, can we think of any ones that would be uh, upside? Uh, so I think upside has a couple of different connotations because upside could be, you know, it's, it's often thought in, in finance that, you know, deflation is bad and inflation is good. Uh, and so you get that deflationary insolvency shock, it's, it's quote bad. And if you get the, uh, you know, the inflationary outcome, it's good because that's what policymakers are literally aiming for. Whereas really, you know, I think that there are shocks about the upside and the downside because if you do get that deflationary shock in such a highly levered world, uh, then yeah, then you do get like a March-like scenario where, where at risk assets sell off, the dollar goes up, uh, you get that, you know, that boogeyman comes out of the closet again. And I do think, you know, it's a good thing that people are still considering that because otherwise, you know, this trader would be done already, right? It, it's, there, it's, if every single person gets on one side of the boat, uh, that's when the trade's done. Yeah. And so as long as there still is that, that, you know, a fear, uncertainty and doubt, right. There's still like, there's still, there's good, good arguments for deflation. There's good arguments for inflation. Uh, and so as long as that debate is raging, uh, you know, there's, there's not too many people on one side of the trade, at least in the long-term sense, like two people can be piled in and then kind of yeah. a near term, you get a correction. Uh, but you know, there, if you look at where big money's invested, you know, big money is still in, you know, the broad S and P 500, it's not in commodities. It's not in the rest of the world. It's, it's still piled into, you know, large cap U S stocks. And so, you know, kind of the more tactical position is, is short uh, dollar and, you know, 
uh, all that, whereas big money still hasn't, you know, th those oceans haven't really rotated yet. Uh, and so I do think that there are risks of, you know, sol insolvency spikes, dollar spikes, deflationary spikes. Uh, and so all of those are things I'm concerned about. And that's why, you know, I express a lot of this through equities and I tend to prefer some of the, the higher quality equities. So for example, if I'm going to invest in an energy company, I'd rather buy one with a strong balance sheet and, you know, low production costs. They can get through a, a rough yeah. period rather than buy the absolute most levered, you know, piece of junk out there that, you know, that, that, you know, it can have higher percent gains, yeah. uh, but they can get wrecked, wrecked if the, if the thesis takes longer to play out. So I like to do, you know, I, I always err to the side of solvency and conservatism uh, when even when I'm kind of investing along Small. my theme. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and so that that's how I'm viewing it basically is, you know, uh, maintaining kind of portfolio construction, maintaining a, an emphasis on quality so that, uh, you know, you can handle those kind of pushbacks against the overall thesis because yeah. those 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 deflationary forces, those dollar debts, those insolvency risks, those are all real. They're not they're not to be dismissed. And especially when when. You know, things get overbought, uh, you know, that's when you have to be, you know, more cautious. Uh, crazy scenario. The World Economic Forum is right. We have a grid down period and hacking of banks and they blame it on Russia, North Korea. Uh, that would be a, overall a deflationary frightening event, uh, I'm assuming, in our worldview books. Uh, where, where's the defensive plays in that environment? Sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, sure. I, I think so uh, Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum um, yeah. uh, is, is elevating his profile quite extensively now along with the, the pandemic outcomes and various other things. And he's recently done a, uh, another almost warning, ominous uh, prediction, um, having previously predicted the, the scope for the pandemic prior to it happening. And his latest scenario of shock and awe would be um, a, a threat that he identifies is uh, cross-national hacking. So he would say uh, an attack. So he's, he's kind of calling a black hat, a black hat uh, sort of um, tech, tech-based hacking on financial services. Uh, there's been an escalation of chatter. I'm observing through the Economist and a variety of other uh, FBI tweet feeds of various other that people have been getting into the Treasury. Specifically, they mentioned the Treasury. And you're a master of understanding um, how we loan money into uh, existence. Uh, so there's bad actors type events, which is basic on, based on nation states. Let's just leave it at that as a possible scenario that sees some sort of disarray being sown into the economic system. Uh, and my assumption is that's invariably going to be a deflationary event that will be deflating for stocks and many other things. Um, were that to come to play, um, how just as a scenario uh, that could be a sort of follow up COVID type event, how, how would folk, if they felt this was a plausible event, how, would, how do you position for that? Uh, I'm assuming tangibility, obviously, because we're talking about electricity. In, in that so scenario, they also spoke of an electricity grid down. In, in other words, disabling a large part of a nation state. We, we're very digitized now. So this is a, this is a switching off of uh, most things, like a stream like this would obviously not be possible, and many other things, and the internet down, etc. I'm just curious. It's quite, it's quite a little bit, uh, forgive the question, a little bit uh, apocalyptic, but um, nonetheless, uh, I'm just considering it. Yeah, if you do get a tail risk like that, uh, you know, I think it would be a lot like March. And of course, it depends on how long it persists, right? So, you know, if, if it happens for, for days or weeks, that's different than it, if it somehow happens for months. And so, you know, earlier, you know, earlier this month, we saw, you know, the, the U.S. Treasury was reported to be hacked into. We had a really extensive cyber attack on U.S. systems, uh, you know, uh, 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 that's supposed a by the Russians. Uh, and I think that's still being confirmed. But I think I think the suspicion is that it's the Russians is a very sophisticated attack. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that was, that was one of those hacks where, uh, you know, they got a lot of emails and they got a, you know, they've been doing it for months. So they collected a ton of information, but of course they didn't shut down any sort of key infrastructure. Uh, you know, there are, you know, there are risks around utilities being attacked, uh, or, you know, other kind of major defense systems being attacked, things like that. And if you were to get, you know, kind of a, a cyber attack driven power outage or internet outage, uh, that is of course catastrophic at our very, uh, you know, uh, digital focused age. And that's, you know, uh, you know, that's one of those cases where probably precious metals would be one of the better investments to hold in that case. Right? I was so thinking if, that. Even if, 
Sorry, carry on. Yeah, no, even, no. If, even, even if people are bullish on Bitcoin, and I am, and if you're bullish on other things like that, uh, you know, that's where one of those things where, where physical precious metals would be a nice hedge. Uh, and so I think that's one of those scenarios that that's hard to plan for, right? Tail <laughs> risks are inherently challenging to plan for because if you base your portfolio on that happening in any given year, it's a low probability of like a yeah. you know a massive you know cyber attack that brings down utilities and things like that. So uh, it's one of those things where you want to maybe have a hedge for it, uh, but not plan around it. Uh, and of course, you want to have whatever safeguards you need in your own home. You want to have access to resources, food, uh, you know, something off the grid. Uh, you know, people have their own kind of, uh, you know, ways of pr preparation. Uh, but basically, you know, society is very kind of uh, fragile. The way we structured yeah. things over the past several decades, supply chains are fragile, computer networks are fragile, uh, you know, just this how we manage our resources are fragile. And really the pandemic showed that, right? So the pandemic showed how fragile our supply chains are, how kind of uh, vulnerable our economy is that, you know, we have this pandemic and we, we do shutdowns and we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of restaurants go out of business while while big companies just come in and take their market share. And we have uh, protests because people are, you know, just are cooped up and they're, they're facing all sorts of financial issues and then there's social issues. And so it kind of showed that it's a very kind of, with so much debt in the system and so much interconnectivity, it's inherently a very fragile system that, that's vulnerable to any sort of shocks, either ones that you think are, are you know, that you're identified ahead of time or ones that you don't identify at all. Yeah. No, uh, it's a difficult one to answer because it's so out there. Um, but it, it's just, I think there, there seems to, the, the part of the pandemic thinking is that more and more people have uh, opened their minds to these tail risks, as you correctly uh, suggested. And uh, it seems uh, we might not be over them and there might be forecasting of, of other end of cycle. You're a fan of the fourth uh, turning, I think, uh, have I said this, the name right of the book? And it just seems like there's quite a lot of turmoil potentially to be navigated. And what is the defense? And I don't think you can actively defend for that because unless you have information that's happening, but you can have a component of it in a portfolio, which will hopefully yep. outperform. Because otherwise, if you set up for that event and you go 10 years without anything happening, you've lost uh, immense um, alpha in terms of your performance. Uh, for uh, being a pessimist. <laughs> okay, I'm going to uh, check the questions um, and just keep uh, in touch. Um, yep, so the guys are talking about Russia. So uh, I, think, I think I heard somebody even refer, we had George uh, on and he was referring to Russia representing uh, value in a sense on both debt and, and other things. Is it a market that you talk about or consider much? In, uh, I think you did say, so apologies, energy is uh, quite dominant, obviously. I think you said uh, you saw that. Uh, and the ruble is strengthened against the dollar a little because everybody has. Um, and of course, they don't have the debt that they used to. Where's the emerging place? And you also mentioned Malaysia. South. Well, you didn't say Malaysia specifically, but Southeast Asia. If I just flick through uh, to an interesting uh, Seeking Alpha article. Uh, I'm reminded of Harry Dent's favorite subject, uh, which is demographics, which uh, in this particular uh, article, they're referring to it as the iceberg of investment management. It's 90% underwater and moves quite slowly. The cycle is generational as well. So it's, it's sort of a very slow steamroller, but you can't fight it. Uh, so one cannot trade the process, but ultimately it's the primary determinant of the economy. Um, if people are thinking and they're fluid, should we not all be in um, on on the if we're just playing the demographics, which as they've already said is quite slow and steamrolls slowly, should we not be in uh, Malaysia where the average age is you know 27 um, and it's a young growing economy, growth following the, the the population numbers because we are on the wrong side of the boomers now um, and we have bad pension issues in the states and in Europe. Um, do you, what's your take on the demographic uh, challenge? Where's the great growth going to come? Uh, so I am bullish on Malaysia. In addition to good demographics and a pretty good tech culture, uh, they also uh, have uh, pretty high uh, foreign exchange reserves as a percentage of GDP. And, and that's because if you look back in the late 90s dollar spike, uh, you know, Malaysia was caught up in the in the Asian financial crisis, right? So you had, you know, you had crisis in Thailand, you had crisis in Malaysia, you had crisis in Russia uh, and, so, and then South Korea. And that, you know, that spread uh, throughout the region. Uh, and a lot of those countries are the ones that are really prepared this time. And so, you know, they learned from the issues of the late 90s, early 2000s. And so 
uh, you know, Malaysia built up big foreign exchange reserves, Thailand built up big uh, foreign exchange reserves, South Korea did, uh, and Russia did. And so they all went into this period uh, with much stronger fundamentals. And so some of the currencies were sold off temporarily. Some of them are still like ru ruble, still pretty cheap. Uh, but the, the front and the Russia, you know, if we start kind of one at a time, Russia has uh, one of the lowest debt levels in the world, whether you look at government debt, uh, uh, household debt, corporate debt. It's all, you know, it's a very under levered uh, society. They have very high foreign exchange reserves. Uh, and, uh, you know, they went into this crisis with a uh, government surplus, a trade surplus. Uh, and low debts. And so they were pretty well prepared. Now, of course, they were slammed by the fact that they're, they're reliant on energy prices being, being pretty solid and energy was killed this year. And so we saw a weakening ruble. We saw, you know, all that. But I, I'm favorable on Russia. Now, they have poor demographics. However, their equities are so extremely cheap uh, and, and pretty strong and, and, you know, reasonably well managed uh, that I'm, I'm pretty bullish on Russia. And so, for example, if you look at, uh, you know, the, the oil company Luke Oil, for example, yeah. uh, that's cheaper than most other energy majors. Uh, they have longer oil reserves than most other energy majors. Yeah. They have less debt than most other energy majors. And so basically for dollar for dollar, you're getting a much stronger company. And, you know, they are, they actually had some of the best returns on invested capital and the best total returns over the past 10 and 20 years. Yeah. And because Luke Oil, ha Luke Oil has a, a very Western style of management, the optimized shareholder returns, uh, you know, they were influenced by Mark Mobius and others. And so, you know, they, they historically have a very strong set of management. And so uh, basically you get a lot more bang for your buck with them compared to, say, like ExxonMobil, you know, as an example. And they have a low production cost. Uh, so that's an example of value. Uh, yeah. And it's, you know, it's kind of separate from whatever Russian demographics are going to do. Similarly, if you look at, you know, Russia's leading bank, Spurbank, uh, they have, you know, some of the highest returns on an equity uh, among global banks. They have a wide economic moat, dominant market share. Uh, they're one of the most tech savvy banks, right? So they're they're deep into digital adoption, uh, and they they've tested blockchain technologies. Uh, you know, so they are, and they're historic. They're way cheaper than uh, other banks around the world, and because no one's really interested in Russian stocks. And so, give us that name again, pretty, Lynn, and I'll pull it up for you. Sorry, I missed it. Uh, that'd be Spurbank, S B E R, Spurbank. And so, you know, there's a there's an ADR, and then of course it also trades on Moscow Stock Exchange. And so that has uh, historically been, uh, you know, it's been a, a weak performer like most banks over the past, you know, five to 10 years, uh, but they, uh, you know, are extraordinarily deep and they generally are, are pretty profitable. And uh, so uh, I think overall Russian equities are pretty attractive. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like an emerging market um, you're interested in. I'm just sitting wondering with our trading uh, community, uh, whether people ha uh, just care enough to go into the great unknown um, and uh, do that. And I think if you're a global investor, you absolutely should. But I'm wondering, is there, is there particular asset classes right now regularly available, um, not for the global macro individual equity in foreign nations investor, which is probably your forte, but for more for our retail trader and investor that you feel is your hottest position right now? I mean, let's touch on cryptos. Uh, you are a Bitcoin bull and you were, uh, you made a great document, which I've already referred to, uh, that dealt with many of the issues. We dealt with could the government cancel Bitcoin, for example, and we considered all the potential risks. And I think we came to the conclusion anything's possible, but it's not particularly likely. Uh, how do you feel uh, given uh, the crypto's recent moves? Uh, because obviously we what applied at ten or twelve thousand uh, now sees uh, the better part of twenty-four thousand. If I just bring our crypto chart up, and on the big time frame, it's virtually uh, straight up. Um, and in fact, I can even drop that to a dual weekly, a uh, fortnightly chart, and it's super strong. Yeah, I'm I'm still bullish on uh, Bitcoin, and so I originally uh, uh, pivoted on Bitcoin. I entered it uh, in April uh, at. Uh, 6,900. Uh, and then I, I kept reiterating that with public articles. So I, you know, my first article was, it was a little over 9,000. Uh, then I had a second article when, when it was a little bit over 15,000. Uh, and so I've, I've been kind of reiterating my, my bullish Bitcoin view uh, through 2021. I expected to do reasonably well. And there's, you know, there's a couple of factors for that. One is, you know, it's, it's very accessible. Uh, so, you know, people ranging from the United States to, to Russia, to Nigeria, to, you know, Australia, anywhere in the world almost, 
uh, people uh, can access it. And so it's a way for investors to basically have, you know, it's, I, I've seen it described as like an offshore bank account for everyone, right? Everyone can kind of put their yeah. money into this thing that is outside of the jurisdiction of any one uh, government. And of course, some governments try to ban it, try to regulate it. Uh, and, you know, they can do that. Uh, but then other countries uh, remain open to it, and you know it's a it's a decentralized encrypted network, and so it can't be directly stopped uh, easily. And so uh, it's you know, and if you look at you know a lot of people get thrown off by the fact that if they look at the linear chart, it, it looks silly, right? Because it, it 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 goes up in 2017, turns parabolic, and then it has a big crash, and it looks like a bubble. But if you if you zoom out to the beginning, and if you look at the logarithmic chart, and uh, then if you take into account the fact that if you look at how Bitcoin operates, every four years or so, uh, the number of new Bitcoins generated every 10 minutes gets cut in half. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, it's called a, it's called a halving. And uh, generally speaking, if you if you look at the logarithmic chart and then you put the halving points on that chart, you get a very, very clear pattern where, you know, every four years or so, Bitcoin goes through the cycle where it kind of finds a price equilibrium. Then there's a supply shock as the supply gets cut in half demand remains pretty persistent. So then you get kind of a, a big increase in price. Then you get, of course, momentum traders and, and FOMO and everybody piles into it. You get a blow off top. Then you get a crash. You get a consolidation <laughs> again. Then, there, you know, then the four years later, there's another supply having and it all starts again. And we've, we've been through like three of those cycles. And so where we are in the having cycle is historically a very bullish phase for Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. And it's probably, you know, my base case would be that it's going to extend, uh, you know, well into 2021. And we'll see from there. And I keep evaluating it. So, for example, back in in uh, in my November 22nd report, I warned that okay, Bitcoin's uh, parabolic. I'm still very bullish, but I wouldn't be surprised to see you know a, a correction or consolidation here because it was it was it was coming up to all time highs, right? So it yeah. was getting you know, and and that's what it did. So it had that correction on Thanksgiving, uh, American Thanksgiving, and then it you know it went it went sideways for a couple weeks, you know, kind of just staying right under the previous all time highs. Uh, you know, it touched it and then back down. Uh, and then, uh, so my base case then was, okay, until it breaks over 20,000, it's vulnerable to ongoing corrections. Uh, but once it breaks through 20,000, it's somewhat de-risked, right? Because then it, it clears over that resistance. Yep. Uh, and so, and then you just out of nowhere, uh, on the day of the the Fed uh, FOMC meeting, uh, we got Bitcoin just plowed through 20,000 and it, it, you know, it touched 2,400. It's been trading in the, you know, 23. Uh, it touched 24,000. It's been trading in the 23,000 range, uh, and so again, it's you know if you look at the at the weekly chart, it's overbought on the weekly chart as it often was during the 2017 bull run. Some of those uh, overbought periods were associated with pretty sharp corrections, and so I you know I wouldn't be shocked to see you know wake up one day and see Bitcoin in a pretty deep correction, uh, you know, but but that's still within the context of being bullish, uh, you know, with another 12 month view at least. Yeah, it's a high volatility uh, trajectory, which goes with associated strong corrections up to 30 percent, even more. Uh, those blue boxes are those kind of that first year of the halvings, the 2013 post the 12, the 17 post the 16. And uh, we're really just getting started um, at the 20, the back end of the 20. I agree with you and we, we're very strong uh, bullish here, but we also expect we're, we're expecting a bit of a reaction if we run 25-7. That's come purely technical. And like you just said, quite intuitively, um, we also felt that there'd be a small stutter at the, the, the previous technical high, which is also a killer round number as well. Probably next after 10,000 is the 20,000 mark. Um, so, yeah. yeah. It's going great, uh, and we're looking real, uh, really, really forward to that. Any any predictions generally? Any outside uh, outside of the box? What's your? I mean, Saxo, for example, does these uh, out of world uh, crazy calls where it's not about being right. Just stretch your brain, you know, be absurd uh, if you have to. Um, if Lynn Alden, which uh, you aren't typically, you're very rational, but uh, if you were to have an out there, uh, out there possibility that might be underpriced uh, coming up in the new year, I like to try and make bold predictions. We were actually very big on the oil short gold long, uh, the oil to single digits, and we were, we were wrong. We were too uh, timid. It actually went negative. Uh, but do you have something like that, that fundamentally you just think, I just wonder if these two events occurred, that could trigger that and not many people are talking about it and maybe it's it's not being appreciated. What would you put out there? 
Uh, so a couple of things. One is just, you know, continue the previous thing. I, I think Bitcoin could potentially reach pretty silly numbers in 2021. And it's not guaranteed, but, uh, you know, if, if it continues on anything like the previous halving cycles, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see it double and more from here. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I do think that it could be pretty explosive in 2021. Uh, you know, within the context of having corrections being quite volatile. And so, you know, there are certain things that could potentially derail that bull market, uh, but I think left its own devices, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, quite a lot of bullishness to be had there. Uh, the other the other key catalyst I'm looking for, and I don't know if this is going to happen in 2021 or not, but just something I, I think is kind of an end game scenario is that, uh, you know, if you look back in the 1940s uh, at, the, at the previous end of the long-term debt cycle, end of the fourth turning, uh, you had, uh, you know, World War II, and you, so you had massive government deficits, massive debt, uh, and of course the central bank had to to buy a lot of those debts. So you had the Fed buying a lot of treasuries, you had the U.S. banking system buying a lot of those treasuries, and uh, what the Fed did was they did yield curve control. So they said, okay, we're going to hold the long end of the yield curve at 2.5 percent, we're going to hold T bills at 0.38 percent, and we're going to, you know, create dollars and buy treasuries as needed to maintain that peg. Uh, and so given a, an unlimited printing press and a stated thing where, you know, you're going to hold deals at a certain rate, uh, you can do it. Uh, yeah. But then, of course, the released valve is the currency, yeah. uh, because if, if yields are not keeping up with inflation, anyone holding cash or treasuries gets gets killed in real terms. Uh, and so that's what happened in the 1940s, where you had three big inflation spikes. Uh, two of them were double digit inflation spikes, and one of them was high single digits. And if you look at the 10 year treasury yield, it was just perfectly flat at 2.5%, like, like magic, uh, <laughs> because they were doing, they were doing formal yield curve control. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in 2019, uh, some fed officials began discussing the prospect for yield, yield curve control. And of course, in early 2020, after the treasury market, uh, you know, had some volatility, uh, the FOMC minutes, uh, you know, again, fed officials were talking about yield, yield curve control. They decided they didn't need it yet. And that, you know, they'd revisit it in the future. Uh, and so if you were to get uh, an inflation spike, uh, you know, whether it's late 2021, whether it's 2022, it's, you know, some point in the next several years, if you were to get an inflation uh, trend, you know, in the 1970s, they were able to raise rates because there were very low debt levels. Uh, but in the 1940s, they did not raise rates. They held rates low and they did yield curve control because uh, sovereign debt was so high and the fiscal deficits were so high. And so I do think that if you were to get that inflation spike, the Fed would come in and do yield curve control. And that's where things get interesting because then, you know, if, the, if they say, okay, we're not going to let the 10 year go over 2%, if inflation goes to, I mean, let's, let's call it 5%, then you have negative 3% real yields, uh, you know, based on, you know, say official CPI. Uh, and then, you know, you can get a blow off in, in gold, silver, commodities, Bitcoin, whatever the case may be. Uh, and then, of course, some of those markets are very, uh, you know, levered in terms of paper, right? So yeah. if you if if you get a massive gold spike, if if a lot of the bond market wants to pour into gold, uh, you could potentially, you know, disrupt the futures market, uh, and uh, you know, kind of kind uh, kind of call a bluff on that big paper market. And so uh, that that's where some of the kind of the upside catalyst could be, as as far as the precious metals uh, market is concerned. And so, you know, I, I think that, and of course, if you look at uranium, people are, that are that have been following the uranium space, uh, again, I don't really know if it's a 2021 story, but if you look at it over the next five years, uh, there are some pretty significant uh, supply demand imbalances that are projected. And so, you know, uranium is one of those things that could it could double or triple. And then, of course, some of the uranium stocks that are levered to that outcome uh, could go up pretty dramatically. And so I, I think there are some of those asymmetric things out there ranging from Bitcoin to uranium to, you know, some sort of yield curve control kind of driving at precious metals. I think there are a couple of those kind of stepwise increases where, you know, you might make, wake up one weekend and there's been some announcement and everything's limit up. And so uh, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that could be challenging to trade. Yeah. Uh, well, I like that. Those are great scenarios. You almost have me wishing for some of them because uh, I like the uranium call. Uh, it falls into the commodities. I think it's clean power with nuclear. We did this whole reversing out of nuclear with Fukushima, and I think there's a, a, a flow back in now. 
uh, because we aren't going to fill the gap as fast as we want, uh, no matter what we will for the green environment. Uh, in fact, uh, your your colleague and friend George was referring to coal. He's still in the old school as well, and he sees that as part of the gap for, for energy requirements as well. Um, I like the uranium. I love the idea of Bitcoin. I do think it's probably your best trade, but it's high volatility and you're going to have to watch it. Um, so you should definitely have a, a, a bit of that. But the best thing is not to watch the chart too much and lock it up. Um, very good. Lynn, thank you so much. Uh, we've taken a lot of your time. We love having you on. Such great insights. I like that uh, summary of the, the big outsiders that could come romping home. The Fed's uh, uh, control of the yield curve. Do you think that as a parting shot, having done all these bad things in the 40s and realized that it kind of didn't work, do you think we're going to go revisit errors? Do we really need as a, another generation learning the same mes uh, messages? Is that history? Does it have to be that way? This is kind of more of a philosophical final question, but uh, do we have to go? Do, do, do people not know the history? Are we going to revisit this, this whole MMT thing and pivoting so, uh, you know, hard UBI, communist proliferation? Um, but, Oh, it's quite a lot bigger. It's quite a fatter tail. It's looking quite a fatter tail possibility than um, you would have thought five years ago. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where, you know, it depends on what, what you're looking at. And so I, I, I hope they learn some of the lessons, especially about war and especially about other things like that. Uh, if you look at the policymakers perspective, they often look at the 1940s as favorable because, you know, they devalue debts. So they, they cleared out the debt problem. Of yeah. course, you know, if you're a bond holder or a cash holder, you got killed, uh, but they, you know, they, they, they devalued the debts. And then, of course, the United States had a boom in the 1950s. And so, uh, you know, from their perspective, that was not necessarily a failure. That was, you know, a success. And of course, you know, wh when you were an investor at the time, it would depend on what assets you were positioned in. If you were in cash, if you were in bonds and other paper like that, uh, it was obviously you got hurt. Uh, but if you were in equities, if you were in real estate, uh, if you were in silver, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, you did pretty well. And so, uh, you know, but it was also that, America post World War Two as well, which had huge yeah. benefits when everyone else was destroyed uh, and indebted. Um, so, yeah. And, and yep. And Europe, for example, Europe had, you know, United States had a significant currency devaluation. But if you look elsewhere, their currency devaluations were even bigger. Yeah. And so in this era, you know, because back then the United States was a net creditor nation, yeah. uh, and now we're a net debtor nation. We're running trade deficits, uh, and so I do think that you know, going forward, uh, you know, I think that some of the some of the, you know, st structures of power could shift. I do think that some of the currencies could shift pretty markedly, uh, and I don't think that policymakers are going to particularly learn from it, especially because you know, <laughs> whether in an environment where it's either you know print or let the treasure market fail, uh, they're always going to choose print. Uh, and so, you know, the best we can do is position for it uh, and, uh, you know, uh, just to have all the different outcomes kind of ready. So you can have hedges for different scenarios. You can have base cases, you know, in addition to some of those explosive things I talked about, uh, you know, I think you, you asked before, like if someone's interested in, in international equities but doesn't want to go into individual stocks, there's, of course, there's always ETFs, other things like that, that you can get kind of a broad, you know, say global stock exposure or you can buy a single country ETF and get exposure to a specific market. And that can that can balance out your risks a little bit so that you, you might have commodity exposure, you might have Bitcoin exposure, you might have global equity exposure, you might have some exposure to you know appropriately valued US equities, whatever the case may be, uh, to have that kind of range of, of outcomes uh, prepared for. Absolutely. Uh, brilliant comment. Really enjoyed uh, having you on. Thank you so much for visiting us again. I want to wish you and your family a very special Christmas. Well done on putting in such an amazing year and impressing us all and enlightening us all. Uh, everyone, please go check out Lynn's free newsletter and her premium service for not much more than a good meal. Uh, you're getting access to one of the leading minds and researchers. Lynn Alden, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, truly appreciate and have an amazing uh, resting period. Uh, Christmas, whether you celebrate or not, and uh, New Year. Thank you. Yep, thanks for having me, and uh, Merry Christmas to you as well. All the best. Bye-bye.